Good evening to everybody. Um, so good to, uh, we've got some copies over there um, as you come in the door and kind of disperse. You can see Mother Serrano burning up the highway. Back in fellowship. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But tonight we're getting back into uh, First Samuel. Uh, we've been dealing with Saul being chosen as king. And Samuel was their leader at first. And you know that transition, the children of Israel uh, got tired of Samuel. But we know their personality. I tell you, the children of Israel had issues, uh, just like we do. And so that whole process. So uh, Samuel actually chooses, and I put a little uh, king picture up there, another king picture, and Saul. That's the picture of Saul. And we're going to kind of deal with some background and actually what was happening with God allowing Saul to be king. As we get into the background of the text, uh, I've left this up here so we can refresh our memories. But someone go ahead and read the background of the passage, please. During the time of the blood, Israel had been under the plan and had suffered grievously as a result of the use of the Lord's discipline. And even the priest, that is, the house of Eli, became wicked. God raised up a young man in his family to believe their faith. But the judge and the prophet, the God of Samuel, was able to exert a strong more influence on the nation. As he aged, however, sons became corrupt. The elders of Israel made a decision. They asked for a king so they could be like the other nations. They were, in effect, rejecting God. And Samuel told them so. Nevertheless, God pledged to give them what they wanted. Remember, we've been working through this whole uh, chapter, uh, dealing with this whole process. Israel wanted to be like everybody else. And I really want you to focus on this because I've said this over and over and I've found it out in my life. If you want something and you keep pressing God, he'll let you have it. He'll let you have it. Um, um, raising kids, you know, it gets tough. You want to do what God wants you to do, but if you got a kid to keep nagging you and nagging you, uh, sometimes it breaks you down at that point. Kids don't listen to that. But it just, just breaks you down. And I don't think God gets broken down. He can just use all aspects. He can use all issues. So today as we go into it, we're actually going to uh, start it around the fifth verse, but I just want us to refresh our memory uh, of this whole um, prophetic uh, connection that's taking place. It um, starts at 10.1, and I'm just going to read 10.1 to 10.3 real quick. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on his head, and kissed him, and said, It is not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin, in Zelzah, and they will say to you, the donkeys which you uh, went to look for have been found, and now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? So this whole prophetic encounter of Samuel talking to Saul. Then you should go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There are three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine, and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. So this whole prophecy that goes to Saul, it hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen. Very detailed. Someone go ahead and pick up that fifth verse tonight. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where Philistine Jeremy is. Samuel so much. I mean, he was raised up. We followed this whole saga from a little child. Uh, his mother was who? Uh, Hannah. Hannah. Hannah dedicating him, saying, hey, I give him to the temple. Uh, and who was the, the priest before Samuel? Eli. 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 So this whole process, we've seen, we've grown up with Samuel. We also found out, even though Samuel is one of the greatest prophets of the time, his kids are messed up too. They've got some issues. So the children of Israel, they want a king like everybody else. So now this Samuel, still hearing from God, he's telling Saul, 
every detail that's going to happen. None of this, and I put that, all of this has not yet happened. Now this is encouraging to me because sometimes we miss out on this fact. God knows everything, everything that's going to happen in our lives. Every detail. You know, Mother Serrano, she kind of testified on that on Sunday about Judy. God knew every detail. Uh, uh, Mother Harris is getting ready to go in with surgery. God knows every detail that's going to happen. And that should be comforting to us, especially if we trust him. We got to trust him, though. We got to trust him. So here, Samuel is prophesying because he's heard a word from the Lord. These are the exact things that are going to happen. Now, look as this begins to unfold. Someone read verse 6, please. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. I love this part. The Spirit of the Lord is going to actually come upon who? Saul. Saul. I must explain, Old Testament, the Spirit would actually sit upon kings, sit upon prophets, but he wouldn't stay there all the time. You'll see it says come upon um, when you look in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit in chapter 2 did what? It came from the top of their heads and went where? Soles of their feet. So the biggest change between the Old Testament to New Testament is God dwells in your heart. Um, the scriptures are very clear. You can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, it was all looking to the future, to the Messiah, and God would still allow his spirit to sit on men. But look at this, he's still prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. The Holy Spirit would enable Saul to declare the word of the Lord with what? With the prophet. The Spirit was going to allow Saul to do something that he could not normally do. Just an awesome picture there. Then it says, change it to another man. With this empowerment by the Holy Spirit, Saul would emerge another man, equipped in the manner of Gideon, and Jephthah for the deeds of valor. Now, this is the question. I put this here and I want you to really think about it. What does being turned into another man mean to you? Change. Change. What else? Read more, read more. Read more. But Deke, you got something. What, what's, what's wrong with this? It, it, it means to me, you know, turn into like a man of God, but temporarily. <laughs> okay, all right. We, if you, you study Saul, you're going to find out this spirit is going to set upon him, but the spirit is going to leave him too. All right? And actually another spirit later on in his life, demons are going to sit upon him. So please understand this Old Testament principle. God could sit on whoever he wanted to sit, but he would pull away his spirit. New Testament, once God is inside you, he's there. We believe that if you're truly saved, God doesn't take his spirit from us. Now, we can deny him. Um, we can go through some, some issues of life. But if you're truly saved, that spirit always pulls at you. But here, for this brief time, Saul is changed into a different person. Yes, sir. It, it, it seems, you know, that, you know, looking at the life of Saul, that, you know, he might have went down rather than up. I mean, yeah. you know, but... But it does say that, you know, the Spirit was with him. But, you know, then when Jesus came, Jesus said he never lost. And, you know, he, you know, and this thing, so, you know, that, that thing, that, like you said, was different that the Holy Spirit used to sit on people and they would leave you. But when Jesus came, once you truly became saved, you truly became saved, it seems like the question is, some people think they were saved and they were saved. And that's why I encourage us, even in this New Testament age, those who are truly saved, we've got the Spirit. But sometimes we act like the Spirit just sets on us at certain times. And it's, it's great to get excited about God, love the Lord, and there are times that we become more emotional. But if we just think that He just visited us at one time, we're sadly mistaken. We should be able to have those same experiences throughout the week because He's always with us. He's always with us. So that's very important to know. Notice verse 7, though. Uh, he's, this prophecy is coming forth. What's going to happen? Someone read, please. This is awesome. Samuel telling Saul, it's going to happen. God's spirit is going to set upon you. Now, we already know his personality from the past. Saul, um, what, what kind of, what kind of, attitude does he have now? What, what, kind of, what kind of person is he right now? 
Okay. He's timid. He's, he's, he's humble. He's a shy person. I mean, he is. I mean, he's the he's just a really nice guy in a sense. Okay. So God is gonna have to work on him to even get him to that leadership position. So please, please remember that at that point. When the signs come, that you do as the occasion demands. When God comes on you, everything's gonna be aligned. Do what God is telling you to do. Look at that commentary. The three signs, verse two through six report of the found the donkey, the encounter of the three men going to Bethel, and the encounter of the prophets, do what the occasion requires. So Saul was to do what his hand found to do. And that's, when God's spirit is on the inside of us, we've always got to listen to God and follow his voice. And that's the key, that we don't follow ourselves, that we follow God's voice that's always with us. What do you think about the statement, for God is with you? Anybody, what do you think about that statement? For God is with you. Amen. Go ahead, Dee. word that God was going to be with him. But yet, it was tough. God didn't want this to happen. Remember that. Samuel was supposed to stay the prophet. He allowed the children of Israel to have a king because they kept complaining, murmuring. But God is still in it. And, and that's important to know. There's some times in our lives that we're really not supposed to be there, but God allows us to be there, but he'll be with you. Now, now the best way is to do his perfect will, all right? His, his, the way he really wanted you at. But no, if, you, if you've taken the wrong track, God can be with you in that. But you you got to get back to the right track. Does that make sense? Yes. None of that slows down God's plan. None of it shows, slows down God's plan. It's just us that we're dealing with in those issues. So God always wants us to follow his will. But there's always other choices in life. But God is not going to leave us. And I'm so glad about that. He's, he's there for us. Notice, what do you think? God is with you. He's with Saul, even in the midst of this wasn't his perfect will for Israel. Look at verse 8. Someone read, please. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. Now, all of these things are here, remember, prophecy going, just immense detail, and, and it concerns me. I believe that the spirit of prophecy is still around. Um, there's some theologians that would challenge me on that, but I do. I just think that there are a lot of jack-led prophets around. Uh, I really do. I just, I just think there's a lot of folks saying that they got the prophet experience. They don't have prophet experience. And they're telling you stuff that you already would know. You know, give me some details. You know, tell me what color socks I got on or something. You know, just, just give me some details in that whole process. But there's so many people want to prophesy, but they already, you know, like, people getting excited. I'm like, I already knew that. I mean, give me something new. And, and, and notice this. These are very detailed. These are a whole bunch of details that this uh, prophecy is coming for. It says in this commentary, someone read that, please, the town where Saul where Saul eventually would be declared king by Samuel, 11, 14, 15, offer sacrifice before the Lord without the prophet Samuel. And where Samuel slew King Agai, Gilgad was to the east of Jericho, but west of the Jordan River. Burnt offers and peace offers. For seven days, the point of time, Saul was to wait for Samuel to come and tell him what to do. All of these things are here, but there, seven stands for what? I encourage you. I don't want you to get too bogged down, but when you're reading the Bible, numbers are important. They really are. So look at those. Look at those multiples of seven. God likes numbers. You see threes. You see sevens. Twenty ones. They are very, very important. God does not waste um, um, any verbiage. Uh, God uses all that to His glory. So notice this whole process. Why does God have us wait at times? Anybody? Why does God have us wait at times? Test of faith. Test of faith. 
faith. See if we truly trust Him. All right, direction. It strengthens our faith. It strengthens our faith how? Because if you have to wait for something, then you get more exasperated and you're waiting for it, you want it to come quicker. But if you know that it's always going to come in time, then you're going to be able to wait longer and longer to get time for it. All right, Mark? It makes us appreciate it more. Okay, it makes us appreciate it more. That whole process, but a lot of us talk about we don't like to wait, right? We don't like to wait. Yes, ma'am. Produces patience. Produces patience, which is a very important. Yes. I think it makes sure that the glory goes to God. If it happens right away, you know it's not like it happens because we did everything right. If you have to wait, you know that it's God. God gets the glory. Waiting is important. I mean, in our lives, I think a lot of people struggle. I said before with that waiting period you got to trust them. It's okay. It's okay to wait. It's okay. And think about the times that you rushed into things. How did it turn out for you? <laughs> <laughs> I think that goes back to what it says. We not to be on the understanding. It's good to pray and just wait on the Lord. And we need to direct stuff. He hastens ourselves to make decisions. Sometimes they're not good decisions. Amen. And, and sometimes when you get ready to buy something or get something, you can I'm telling you, if you just put time on things, your life will be a lot better. Put seven days on it. Like seven days? I can't wait. Two hours. Put seven days on it. Put a week on it. I'm telling you, your attitude change. God is able to speak to you. Now look at this whole process. This prophecy, verse 9. Someone read. All right, beautiful picture. Samuel prophesies. He's talking to Saul. Saul, he, he's just a normal guy. I don't know, just, just kind of going through, trying to take in all this. I'm going to be king. They had never had a king from this point. It's very vivid here. It says, so when Saul had turned, what happened? <laughs> when he turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him what? Another heart. Another heart. And all those signs came to pass what? <laughs> We're actually going to deal with those, okay? We're going to make sure, because the prophecy, we got to follow it out. God changed him uh, for another heart. God prepared Saul for the kingship by having the Holy Spirit come upon him. Now, this is a serious question. I want you to think about it. Do you think this was fair to Saul? Do you think this was fair to Saul? And I'll, I'll, I'll preempt it with this. Saul never asked for this. There's no evidence in Scripture that he asked. You know what? I want to be the next king. I mean, he was not looking for this. He was chosen. Do you think this was fair to Saul? Because a lot of times that's what God does is just pick people, not so much somebody that was asking for Okay. He wants to. Okay. All right. God just picks people. All right. God didn't pick uh, uh, Saul, but he was a woman king. Okay. But he suffered to be sold. Okay, uh, all right. That Saul would be king, and he, he loved Saul, but he gave him a chance to be right. Okay. <laughs> and God will use anybody he wants to to get his glory. All right, God will use anybody he wants to. Yes, sir. God gave Saul a special opportunity. He didn't make him. He didn't make him take it. He didn't make him do. I mean, you know, he didn't make him be a robot. But okay. he gave Saul a special opportunity, just like he gave a special opportunity to Paul. Okay. Saul took advantage of his opportunity. Saul did. Okay. Also, God equipped us to do certain things. Sometimes we don't get what we want. Okay. And Yeah, I got this because I'm X, Y, and Z, and I did F, W, whatever. 
But when God blesses us with something that we couldn't imagine in our wildest dreams, it goes, wow, I really didn't deserve this. Wow, you know, what? I need to stay on God's good side so I can keep this. So, so many times, I think it was a blessing to Saul that he could see God's favor because in those times, the judgment and everything, you didn't get to see God blessing people much. He was either, you know, you were going to the ground or whatever, but he got to see God's blessings and he had the opportunity to show that to the rest of the kingdom. And what an awesome opportunity. All right. Um, I have another question. At the same time, And, and, and I want you to do it. I've told you this before, and I want you to grasp this because it's really blessed me. It, it's helped me to appreciate my, my, my salvation more. God owes us nothing. Let me prove a point, and you can argue. I've dealt with people on this point. In Genesis, Adam and Eve sinned. That sin caused them to die. All the generations afterwards, death. Sin entered in because of that one man's sin or their sin all died. Okay? At that point, God has the right to send everybody to hell. And even at this point, and it helps you to understand what he dealt with Pharaoh and hardening his heart, God does not owe you salvation. He doesn't. He can choose you. He can choose whomever he wants to do, whatever he wants to do. Why? Because he created you. Now, if it's hard for us to grasp that. Because we think we're more than we really are. We really, we, we really think that we're more than we are, that somehow we're entitled because we think and all of that, but we're not, really. It's God's grace and mercy that has allowed us to have an understanding of what we have right now, that we can even grasp where we are. So think about that, man, if God owes me nothing, can he do whatever he wants to do with me? He's the potter, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Are you kind of like blame Adam and Eve? Yeah. I mean, like, so take it out on them. Take it out on them. You can find. <laughs> but that's where sin ended in. Yeah. That's what we're battling with. But there's a second Adam, and his name is Jesus. Thank God. So <laughs> thank God. <laughs> so he's given us that grace through Jesus to have a changed life. But here at this point, you just got to know God can use whomever he wants to use. And we get into that choice, our choice and stuff. I think that choice is overrated because I know God, he's in control of everything. But I think we do need to focus on more so his grace. If he's using you, you can understand him. Don't take that for granted. And a lot of people take that, ah, oh, just because, you know, I go to church that it's okay. No, man, you should be excited that you go to church and that you understand Jesus and that you have the opportunity to walk uh, in his presence. Notice here. His heart is changed for a period of time. Remember the Holy Spirit sits, then it leaves in the Old Testament. So I read verse 10. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. There's a progression. Changes, turns from Samuel, heart change in Saul. As he's walking, prophecy has already came forth. You know a prophet that he's true if it happens. And I challenge you, because a lot of you got a lot of prophecies on you and everything, and you just need to be, you need to start writing some of that stuff down, and you need to stop. Somebody prophesied to you 85 years ago, and it ain't happened. It probably is not going to happen, okay? You know, you, you go win the Olympic championship, and you're 90 now. It's just not going to happen, I'm telling you. And, and some people are believing those things that are lies. So look at the details. The prophecy comes forth, and within a short period of time, it happens. Look at the second part came to the hill, group of prophets to meet him, then the Spirit of God did what? Came upon him, came upon him and then what did he do? Prophesied. Prophesied. He spoke something that he hadn't spoke before. He was among the prophets. He had that spirit. God literally took control of him. Um, what do you think about this, though? Do you think this is right? What, what do you think? The Holy Spirit came upon him. 
Yeah, just took control, made him prophesy. He, he didn't know how to prophesy. Yeah, I, I think it was great. I, I, think, I think he was afforded a special opportunity, but, but I think he chose. I mean, I think the Holy Spirit equipped him and gave him everything he needed to do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
of God's elaborate plan because there are other people that are going to be at the coronation that are going to remember him prophesying, which is going to give him the ability to step up even more so as king. So all of this was laid out. So in your life, God is going to allow you to cross some bridges, meet some people, and it's all in preparation for where he wants you to be at. Nothing is wasted in your life. Nothing is wasted. And if you think back to your life, you think about how people cross and everything. Even yesterday in our afternoon service, I'm just still amazed how God made so many crosses and, and pathways with people that I never knew. And then at that service, it was a God setup. It was a God setup that we came together. And think about your life. Nothing. As you go there, sometimes we just kind of go through our days numb. But don't be so numb. Look around. You know, look at the roses. Let the air breeze. See the people, focus in on the people. Look at the sign. You ever, you ever like travel the same way every day, and you don't even know the streets you turned on. <laughs> you did, you've done this 18 times or 40 times, and somebody asks you what street was the you like, and you you think you know you saw this sign, you saw this sign every day, and you can't even remember the name of the street. Why? Because a lot of times we're going so fast every day that we don't look at around us. So I encourage you, kind of slow down and just kind of look at your surrounding and take in because God is not wasting any of your time. He's not. Notice this whole process. Uh, look at that next verse, verse 14. Someone read, please. This is key. Remember, don't forget the context of a long journey with, with Saul. He went to look for the lost donkey. Remember, the donkeys weren't really lost. They already been found. It was a setup to get Saul to Samuel. So in your life, I'm telling you, everything you do is a setup. It really is. And you just got to look. There's no wasted time with God. So now his uncles come to him. Where have you been? Oh, look for the donkeys. He saw they were nowhere to be found, so he went to Samuel. Samuel was the prophet. He was supposed to tell him where the donkeys was. But we found out, Samuel tells him, you're going to be king, and all these things are going to happen to him. So this whole process is going through Saul's mind, but now his family member is dealing with it. Someone read 15 and 16. It's very important. Someone read. He said, tell me, please, what Samuel said to you. So Saul used to Saul said, I want you to really think about this. Was this lying? Why didn't Saul tell his uncle the whole story? Anybody want to think about it? Was this lying? Why didn't Saul tell his uncle the whole story? Tell If I was sure about that, I wouldn't tell anybody either. Okay, all right. Yes. All right, scared. Well, was he lying? Why did he tell his uncle? He didn't ask him as information. Oh, you you go with the you didn't ask the right question. <laughs> he said, "Where did you go?" Okay. So All right. see, sometimes we get too much information. Okay. So. All right, so you agree with him not not giving out any more information at this point. He said, "What did he tell you?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me what Samuel said to you. Okay. Uh, this is just this is just coming from an angle. I think there's more to Saul than we can see at this point. Really, I I think he's starting to get kind of excited at this point, <laughs> and it's kind of clicking in. He's still scared. He's still skittish. But I think there's some things that are starting to click on the inside. He's already remember God's given a new heart. Um, he's prophesied, so he's starting to look at individuals. He's starting to, his, his, his expanse is opening up. Because as a king, you're going to have to deal with all kinds of people. And, and it's, it's amazing that the uncle would come in him very detailed, what did he say? It's almost like the uncle's like, okay, something went down. Something went down, I need to know, I don't know what kind of uncle this was, but something went down and, and Saul kind of withholds the information. 
but soon everybody's gonna know. Since we don't know what kind of, like you said, we don't know what kind of person that uncle was. Sometimes if you give out too much information, too much information too soon, people try to store it. Okay, all right. So, so maybe he was like, man, I gotta keep this because I don't want anything to go wrong. All right. Look, yes, ma'am. Mother May is very, very honest. There's sometimes we talk too much. You, you ain't gotta tell everybody everything. Right? If this guy is gonna come fast, you don't have to worry about it. Some people just talk, they just blah, 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 blah. And, and, and you know, wanting to share all of that. And that's great if God has put that on your heart to share. But sometimes we just need to keep it to ourselves. And, and I do commend Saul at this point, kind of keeps it himself, because he's gotta let this thing resonate, but he's still struggling and going through some things. Someone read 17 and 18, please. Everybody's coming together. Saul gets, or Samuel gets everybody together. They're at Mizpah. As they're there, he begins to give the address to the people. Remember, they already said, we want a king. This is going to be set up for the king. I brought up Israel out of what? If, if you haven't read that whole process of the Egyptian uh, and, and God from Joseph all the way up, Red Sea, wilderness, you need to. That is very important. That is critical to your understanding of the Bible. Because <laughs> all of the, 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 the people, the apostles, they, they refer back to that. That is very critical. God delivered them out of Egypt. So he goes back to that whole process. And then he talks about um, that, and delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all kingdoms and from those who oppressed you. The Lord's choice of Saul was made public at Mizpah, the place of the spiritual revival before Israel's victory over the Philistines. So this is a, a mini revival. King is going to come forth. Now look at this. Isn't it amazing at how faithful God is in spite of our issues? So kind of a statement question is put in. In spite of Israel wanting a king that they shouldn't have wanted, God is still faithful to them. Right? Some of y'all need to be shouting. I mean, in spite of you all this stuff and you got it that you shouldn't have it, God is still faithful and he's trying to work it out. And this is a part of his elaborate plan. Even our bad choices, God is still blessing. It's an awesome God that we serve. Um, look at verse 19. Did that one hand? 19. Yes, when? I think you said yesterday um, about, if you think about how many times we've messed up. Favorite is like VeggieTales, and it's Jonah, and, um, and he's just going in there, and, and the Ninevite, and at the end of the film, it's this lightning bolt comes down, and it's just it's the last person. We all deserve lightning bolts at all. We all just deserve to be just wiped out. All of us. Just stop. Just about yourself for a little. Bit. All of us just need to you know. <laughs> Thank you. All of us. God is so, so gracious that even in this, Israel, I'll tell you, even yesterday talking about the Israelites, when God came off that mountain and saw them doing their thing, God said, stand back, Moses. And I get to talk about this because God said, stand back, Moses, I'm here to kill them all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was so God, I was like, just wipe them out. He did. Moses interceded for them. 
that, that God didn't kill them. But he was. God was like, it's, these, these, it's useless. It is useless. And I know he feels like that so often. But I'm so glad for intercessors. And most importantly, we talked about uh, God's grace. Look at this. Where are we at now? 19. Did we read 19? Someone read 19. <laughs> But you have today rejected your God, who himself saved you from all your adversaries and from your tribulation. And you have said to him, No, set the king over us. Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. Dean Kelly, go and read the commentary, please. Despite the past faithfulness of God to his people, they still desire a human king to deliver them from the hands of their enemies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can't you see Samuel standing there? I mean, it's like... God has delivered us over and over again. God himself, look at that, God himself saved you from all your adversaries and your tribulation. And you have said to him, no. Set what? Have we all been there? Mm -hmm. No, God, I got to do it my way. I know, thank you. Appreciate all those deliveries and stuff, but I got this. I got this. I can control this. All right. But we already know how it's going to turn out bad because you're not doing God's perfect will here. But God still, even his impatience with the Israel, he's still so kind and so loving. Look at this next scripture, verse 20. Yes, I think this is kind of, kind of funny. It says, but you have today rejected your God. They didn't say, uh-uh, no, we didn't. We didn't reject your God. Uh, they were not even... Remorseful, they were happy. I mean, they, they didn't deny the fact that they were rejecting them. They, they didn't say a word. They didn't try to say nothing because they wanted what they wanted so bad. They, they were called out and they still, you know, they kept quiet because they wanted what they wanted so bad. How many times we do that? We want what we want. <laughs> you know, somebody has called us out about it. Somebody has given us a fair warning. Could have been a child, a mom, a grandma. Somebody gave us fair warning. So we didn't say a word because we wanted what we wanted so bad. Amen. Mm. That yes. scripture that says, um, you continually call on me, yet you don't do what I tell you to do. You're right. We've all been there. And, then, I mean, and that's true. I think all of us have. I, I, I can remember I can remember times where looking back where maybe you got upset or something, you know, and the Holy Spirit came. So for me, what to do? And I was talking to myself. No, they can't get away with this. They're going to take it. Basically, talk to the Holy Spirit. You're going you know, to do it your way. I mean, I, I was going to do it my way. You know? No, they're going to take it. They can't get they 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 away. Mm -hmm. But we could, like, leave it alone. We start, I mean, husband, wives. I mean, you know you're not supposed to fight arguing. But then just sometimes you go, we need to get this off. <laughs> 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 no, Rochelle, leave Rochelle. I know, I know him and Sister Chandler must go out. I know they have. I know they have. You know, I can see. And, and they know the right way. But then, then just sometimes, you know, Holy Spirit, I got there. I just, I can't let this one go. But this is whole process. They're so brazen in their attitude. We want what we want. And amazing thing, God is going to allow them to happen. Pain, 
if you just go ahead. There's there's somebody else that has experienced the same things you've experienced. And oftentimes God will give us a picture of their failures so we don't have to. But it's our choice. We read that and we make this this great thing, you know. That's not that happened to them. But it, 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 it can't happen to me. I'm, I'm smarter than deal. I'm smarter than deal. It can't, I'm not gonna get caught. Well, they got caught, you're going to get caught too. But that whole process. Look at verse uh, 20, someone read, please. All right, now this is the pulling. We got it. We got to get to the king. We pretty much told him, you know, y'all shouldn't have this, but here. So now it's coming down. God is speaking. We got to find where Saul is. Kind of, he's been missing. <laughs> so now God chooses what tribe? Benjamin. Very, very key. What is What are the Benjamites known for? <laughs> Left hand. Left hand. And also that terrible time. Of, of what did they do? What's the, what's something else they were known for? They 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 murdered people, and also there was a time of the Benjamites where homosexuality was involved in it, and God had to wipe out a whole bunch of them. The men just had to come, and uh, that was when they cut up the girl. Remember that? They sent the pieces off. I have to preach about that sometime. I hadn't got mature enough to preach on that one yet. But yeah, he, he cut up the pieces of the girl and sent them out to the tribes. And they actually had to come against the Benjamites uh, for judgment. So here at this point, the, Benjam the Benjamites are the smallest clan. Uh, Saul is in that clan. But as they come forth, look at the next step. Someone read 21. When he had called the tribe of Benjamin to come here by their families, the family of Matri was chosen. And Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they saw him, he could not be found. <laughs> the lot is falling. Now remember, Sammy's already met Saul. They already had this elaborate conversation just some hours before this. Saul has gone through this prophecy. Uncle, he didn't tell him the whole story. But he's at the coordination because everybody has to be there. He's, he's huddling back there somewhere. And, and the calling is already on him. But he's running. And that's the question. Have you hidden from a call. Mm. It doesn't have to be like the preacher, but I believe everybody's a preacher in some sense, but just what God has called you to do, have you hid from it? And that's what Saul is doing, hiding, like somehow that's going to keep God from doing what he wants to do. <laughs> All of us know that you can keep running, you can keep hiding. God's going to, I'm so confident in God, he's still going to get you. That's right. He is, he's still going to get you. And some people, they go to this process and and, and we go back and forth with this choice, this choice. <coughs> Some people you say, well, I was called to preach, and I never preached, whatever that means, and they old. And, and well, God called you, don't you think he can get you? Yeah. And so you wonder, we, <laughs> we go to that whole process, and there is choice, there is, but your choice, this is a statement, I'm going to stand on this, your choice never overrides God. Amen. Does that agree? That sound right? That's a tweet. Your choice never overrides God. Because God is all powerful. No matter what your choice is, God, and we see this, his choice is to hide. If I hide, maybe they won't find me. If I hide from this, then maybe I won't be king. So he's hiding, and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they saw him, can you see the people that are looking around? Did not be found. Now look at this, verse 22, someone read. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord's father. I love this verse. It's a funny verse. It really is. Because they're looking for him. They're going, these people are excited. They're just, they're like, this is a celebrity that they haven't seen before. All right. They're like, okay, God, who have you chosen as king? And so they asked a very serious question. They inquired, has the man come yet? He's not, this is his coronation. Maybe he's in the bathroom or something, you know. And then the Lord answers them. What does the Lord say? There he is. The Lord says this to, to Samuel and the people. There he is. He's hiding under the cliff. 
God knows where you are. You can run. I'll say this again. You can't hide from God. You can hide from other folks. God already knows where you are. He already knows what's in your heart. He already knows the situation. He will find you if he wants to find you. I'm telling you. That that um that kidnapping um, just lately when the guy was out in the wilderness and by chance as they were in this deserted wilderness there was somebody else that happened to be walking by the same time and and it was just the Holy Ghost connection in a sense and it was like something's not right and they were able to find this girl in this wilderness all these thousands and thousands of acres they killed a guy who had kidnapped her that was God. That was God. The guy thought by going in the wilderness, I'm going to be able to get away. God says, no, I got that too. God knows where you are. Some of you, if you gave your testimony, you were real. You say, I ran from God. You know, I came to such and such, or I went to New York. I went to Greensboro, North Carolina, get away from God. Guess what? God is there. He found you. He found you. And you can't run from him. You can run from him, but you can't hide. He's going to find you. So there he is, hidden from the equipment. Look at verse 23. So they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he would collar them people from his shoulders up. Oh, this is funny. They go, they go to the equipment. They pull him out because he's high. And they pull him out. And when he stands up, he's towering over everybody. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Grown man is hiding. Yeah, nobody even mentions it. They just go pull him out of, from the equipment and just continue on as if this grown man was not hiding. <laughs> <laughs> they want a king. They, they don't care. They, I don't. I think you could have been a, a little munchkin or something. Like, I think they're like, wow, what's this? But they, they just, they just want a king. <laughs> Hey, but how many times do you, we make it? How many times do you see the lady choose a man? Everybody, he was no good in the beginning. You didn't he, he never been any good, <laughs> you know, or vice versa. Everybody know, but oh, something's going down. Now we know Saul is. He's gonna have a different spirit. God's gonna have to do that. But yeah, some red light should have went out. This guy. Where, where, we, where did God get him from? But the great thing, when he stood, again, what happened? Oh. 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 They're like, woo, yeah. You know, everybody's like, okay, forget that he was hiding. He's bigger than everybody. All right? Look at this, uh, verse 24, someone read, please. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen, that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, Long live the Lord. Saul, Saul had been around them all the time. He'd always been tall. But now the frenzy of wanting a king makes him different. It does. Have you, have you ever wanted something? And, and in that, it was not a real desire. You just wanted it. But maybe somebody else had it, or advertised it, or your neighbor pulled up in it. And you're like, you know, before it was just a casual thought, but now you have to see it every day. You're like, oh, I really got out of And this is what this fervor in the crowd, they just wanted a king. And you can see it when they saw him. All of a sudden, they break out and they say, What? What did they yell? Long live the king. They're just like, I can see them high five. We finally got one. Just like our heathen nations. We got one. We can have a king. And so often, man, we've been put from it. And we shout about stuff that's going to make our lives miserable. We come and we testify about it. I see folks testify about curses in church. Oh, God bless me with this. And I get to see the other side. You know, years down the road, they can't even pay for it. You know, or they lose it. Because it really wasn't a blessing. It really wasn't. It was a curse. It caused them not to come to church, not to be faithful. Their marriage broke apart because all of these choices, bad choices. And this is really a bad, bad thing that they wanted. But God allows it. God allows it. Long live the king. They're just blessing the Lord. I know they're testifying and jumping around. God, thank you. 
<laughs> don't know who you get. Thank you. 